Roguelikes are such an insanely cool genre for video games that even now as I see them getting a bunch of awards, winning game of the year, and just exploding in popularity, I still find myself saying, we need more roguelikes. Traditionally, video games have always been sold as a complete experience. You start your quest, get told where to go, hit the beats in the story, defeat evil, and then you see the credits. Which is enough to make all gamers go, wow. Did I just do But then, as soon as you see the dev's name slowly scrolling up the screen, your sense of joy immediately turns into this deep black pit in your stomach when you realize that you've accomplished what the game wants you to do. And thus, this world that you spent your last few weeks falling in love with is finally saying, get out of here, little bro. bro. Roguelikes are the opposite. The first time you even beat a roguelike, you're just getting started. Oh, you defeated the last boss? Well, guess what, dumbass? That was actually the baby boss, and now his dad is coming home, plus that was half the game, and it was on easy mode. Good luck. This genre has so much content baked in that it is literally impossible to see all of it within your first W. I have over 200 hours in The Binding of Isaac, which believe it or not, is kind of on the low end. Oh my goodness! And I still haven't unlocked more than half of the roster. This concept of creating a very condensed gaming experience, but then adding enough content and variation that this experience is never the same is in essence what makes roguelikes so special. I mean, sure, a run will only take you less than an hour, but at the end of this run, you're using a Valorant operator to snipe Bowser off the top of Rainbow Road. But at the end of this run, you and Tamba are fighting Meta Knight in a space jungle. Also, what the f*** ah. is Tamba up to? It's essentially a PvE title where the environment is working with you and against you in order to craft a unique experience every time. This trains the player to not only be good at the game, but to be good at every iteration of that game. To understand every scenario, to think, breathe, and feel that game, and to be able to dominate the concept of Hi. what that game can be. Translating into a fun, rewarding, and challenging experience that has been blowing up recently for a very good reason. And today, we're gonna talk about this. Well, what the hell, boy? I got a new mic, by the way. I hope it sounds good. Hey. What? What's a roguelike? <gasps> This video is brought to you by OnePlus. Hey, do you know where my headphones are? I can't. What are you doing? Well, I was watching paint dry, but that wrapped up like eight years ago. So you're just staring at a wall? Uh, yeah. I thought that's what everyone did on their free time. That's kind of sad. You know what? Here. What is this? That's a OnePlus 11. So 12? It's a OnePlus 11. It has a Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, which allows games to have hardware accelerated ray tracing, making a lot of them look better than real life does. But what if I wanna do more than just one thing? With 16 gigabytes of RAM, you can keep up to 44 apps open. That number is higher than the amount of people I've seen in my life. Okay. Okay, but can I still look at the wall sometimes? Not only can you use the ultra sharp 50 megapixel camera to get high resolution photos of the wall, but you can also share them with your friends because it's a phone. This OnePlus 11, it's everything I ever wanted. So what are you gonna end up doing for? I'm gonna get out of here. In the year 1980, video game publisher Epix released a game by the title of Rogue, where players go through several floors of a dungeon seeking an amulet at the bottom level. You'd fight off enemies and find equipment to help you along your way, alongside scrolls, potions, and whatever else. I basically just described to you any RPG ever, but Rogue did something different. You see, they had this little funny mechanic called permadeath, meaning once you die, you're dead. You can't just respawn and instead now you have to start the game over all the way from the beginning. This was a design choice specifically made so that every single action by the player would be more meaningful. Now, permadeath may sound like it makes games a lot more challenging and way more tilting. 
Yeah. But this wasn't the only thing that Rogue did differently. Rogue also had the fantastic idea to make the dungeons procedurally generated. Meaning every single time you played this game, the dungeons and layouts would be entirely different. Further emphasizing the concept that this was your only chance in this instance. This added a newfound layer of difficulty because now it wasn't just about being good in one path, but being able to adapt to the path you're given. It kind of feels like playing a PvP game where your opponent is throwing mix-ups and giving you puzzles to solve. Except instead of fighting Chun-Li this time, you're in a fist fight with the backrooms. Though Rogue never got a sequel, its success and reception was enough to create an entire genre in its wake. It was even ranked number 6 in PC World's 10 Greatest PC Games Ever. Rogue's influence knew no bounds and a lot of games came out shortly after trying to replicate its glory. Also, fun fact, do you want to know what Glenn Wickman, one of the head developers of Rogue worked on immediately after finishing this masterpiece? Mavis Beacon teaches typing. Mavis Bacon. I know only like one of you knows what that is, but you're freaking out, right? Over a decade after its initial release, Rogue's gameplay mechanics heavily influenced the creation of 1993's Torneko no Daibokin. Ushigi no Dungeon. The first game of the Mystery Dungeon franchise, which, believe it or not, is still alive and well to this day. The Mystery Dungeon franchise was massive for the growth of roguelikes because up until this game came out, good roguelikes only existed in the PC space, making Mystery Dungeon the first decent roguelike to ever release on console. Now, the name Mystery Dungeon may ring a bell because you've probably heard that name here, and here, and here, and here, and here, oh and here, oh, and oh, here. Pokemon really got seven of these. Wow. It's safe to say that Japan had a very deep and profound love for the genre earlier than the rest of the world. Even though Rogue was developed in the US, it was taking a lot longer for the rest of the world to see the potential of this genre. We were too busy playing SOCOM Navy SEALs on the PlayStation 2 and, and saying sl and Tomba. That's a callback. There were a lot of games that came out in the 90s and early 2000s that borrowed a lot of mechanics from roguelikes, but never really committed to the genre. Notable game dev David Brevik acknowledged roguelikes as an influence in creating Diablo, including the nature of randomly generated dungeons and loot. 2006's Dwarf Fortress, a colony management roguelike which was completely free, made quite the impression as well. Especially because this is one of the earliest games to ever use a randomly generated world. Now that may sound familiar because this game influenced Minecraft. Minecraft. But still, no matter how well received a lot of these games were, the idea of playing a traditional roguelike was still a tall order for most gamers. Until finally, in 2008, a man by the name of Derek Yu decided that he was gonna change things. Derek found inspiration in the roguelike genre and really loved the idea of randomly generated playthroughs. However, he found the turn-based dungeon crawling elements of most roguelikes to be kind of boring. So, taking inspiration from Super Mario, Derek decided to make a weird hybrid, a 2D platforming roguelike by the name of Spelunky. This game featured permadeath, no save points, randomly generated floors, and a difficulty level so high that it should be considered bullying. This was actually on purpose because Derek thought that every player who plays a roguelike should know that you're meant to die. A lot. A lot. Spelunky was especially evil because it just did not give a sh- Even on the first minute of your run, you'll get one-shotted by a random animal or some unfortunate pitfall. Derek said, oh, you like Super Mario, huh? Well, how about Super Mario in hell? Spelunky served as a very crucial turning point in the roguelike genre, simplifying the concept of an ever-evolving game and making it easier to ingest for more casual players who don't necessarily want to deal with the traditional grid-based movement and turn-based combat. Right. Ew. Now, we're about to go off the rails for a couple of seconds because I gotta explain something before we move on. I can already guarantee that someone has already commented about it. There's a word floating around that people use to explain games that are kind of like roguelikes, but not enough like roguelikes to be considered a roguelike, so they use the word roguelite, which means roguelike-like. The only reason this confusing and somewhat unnecessary term even exists is because a group of players and developers in Berlin, Germany established their 
definition of what a true roguelike should be. This is called the Berlin interpretation, but guess what, buddy? I'm not from Berlin. Also, here's the problem. Did you know that the word sus is in the dictionary? Did you know that the word yeet Yay. is also in the dictionary? And that's because words are added into the dictionary when enough people come together and decide that that word means that thing. Everybody uses roguelike. On Steam, the biggest gaming platform on the planet, they tag everything as a roguelike. So if everyone in their mother is using the term roguelike to define most roguelikes, then why should we force the term roguelike to define roguelike likes when we could just use the word roguelike? <gasps> It's just adding unnecessary clutter to an already confusing genre. Moving on. Spelunky being such a successful roguelike that deviated from the path was the first step in seeing how crazy this genre can be. However, if Spelunky took the formula and kickflipped with it, The Binding of Isaac took the roguelike formula and did one of those Tony Hawk combos that are so long they had to whip out the ellipsis. It was part roguelike, part bullet hell, part Legend of Zelda, full of references, synergies, unlockable content, varying boss fights, and anything else your brain can think of. The coolest thing about The Binding of Isaac was that it was designed to get harder the further you get into the game. But then when you beat it, you unlock more content, which in turn changes the game. Meaning the more you play it, the more you unlock, which makes the game different the next time you play it, making you play it more. It may sound confusing, but to put it shortly, the first time you beat the game, the final boss could be this guy. But then once you beat that guy enough, it could become this guy. And once you beat that guy enough, the bosses could either be this guy or this guy. And once you beat them enough, it could be this this guy and then they add DLC that doubles all of the content in the game and what, what the, the f there's a reason why most Isaac players have hundreds and hundreds of hours in the game. Because this game just doesn't end. Binding of Isaac would go on to sell over 5 million copies, which is by far more than any other roguelike. Now obviously, Rogue created the genre over 30 years ago, but I strongly believe that the Binding of Isaac became the catalyst to give us the roguelike landscape we have today. The success of this game served as inspiration for more devs to experiment with the genre, and now we have roguelikes in every shape you can imagine. We have gambling roguelikes, shooting roguelikes, co-op roguelikes, golfing roguelikes versus roguelikes, golfing versus ro- Hold up. Is that real? Okay, they're just making shit up now. If you kill me and I stay dead, am I a roguelike? Now that we're all caught up to speed on what a roguelike is and where the hell they came from, I think it's time to dive into what makes a roguelike so good. Starting with a section that I like to call the condensed experience. There was supposed to be a title card here, but I guess not. A wonderful aspect of the come on. A wonderful aspect of the roguelike genre is how well it condenses the traditional gaming experience. We've all played a million games where we start off with nothing and slowly have to grind our way into getting stronger before the final battle with the antagonist. But in most cases, we're met with side quests, empty worlds, filler content, and grinding. Ew. I mean, I enjoy an open world RPG every now and again, but some of these games are filled with more grinding than that Tony Hawk combo from earlier. Can you imagine having to sit through something that is intentionally made to waste your time for its benefit? What's that? It's been three minutes? Run an ad! Go! Go, go, go! Ah! I did it. I did that joke. The beauty of roguelikes is that instead of doing what most traditional games do in padding runtime by creating massive landscapes and empty worlds, this genre does the exact opposite. And in turn, they create a much more meaningful world in a condensed space. It's like putting a 90 hour action adventure game into a hydraulic press. It is very clear that every square inch of Hades was made to make the player's experience more meaningful. For a game that technically only has four levels, Hades has 59 enemy types, 24 weapons, countless power-ups that change the way you play the game while having interactions Bruh. with one another, a fully customizable overworld, and over 20,000 lines of dialogue. And all of this is stuffed inside of a game that I could clear in under 13 minutes. Yeah, here's proof. Instead of devaluing the content in the game by forcing enough repetition to 
Okay, I think I hit backspace on my script here because that's where that line just ends. Roguelike makes the content have more value because it's the only time that you're gonna see it in this instance. And in turn, every power-up makes you so much more excited because it could be the answer in turning your run into a victory. The randomness of it all basically just buffs the emotions that you're bound to feel. Sometimes you get a game-breaking item in the beginning of the run and you're able to breeze through the whole thing. Other times you have to take a beating and grit your teeth through bad power up after bad power up to hope that you just get something good and other times you just get garbage it's like playing a gotcha game except for twenty dollars you get the whole game and not just a small percentage chance at a new skirt for the png that you fell in love with <laughs> this condensed experience is also really enticing when you look at real world time when presented with a very popular and well-received rpg like persona 5 it's very hard for me personally to commit because i know it's gonna be a 98 hour game but when presented with a game like vampire survivors where i know that each run is only going to be 30 minutes it's easier to get into because it's so short and oh my god it's been 150 hours now i want to dive into vampire survivors real quick because it's a fantastic segue for my next point accessibility 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 it's such a hard word to say vampire survivors alongside other roguelikes does a fantastic job at teaching the player what to do as it goes on making it accessible for anyone the game barely has any buttons and you don't even have to aim your attacks. Yet, there's a reason why it's blown past almost every other roguelike in popularity. Oh, and it's $3. Sure, this genre can and will get complicated in a lot of iterations, but at the end of the day, most roguelikes pride themselves on increasing the difficulty as you progress per run. Meaning the early stages almost always serve as a scroll through baby park. But then later in the game, the levels are hellish. No, literally, a lot of these games use hell, fully encapsulating the idea of easy to play, yet hard to master. I mean, sure, I may have a ton of experience in Vampire Survivors and in turn can win pretty frequently, but if you've never played it, you'll have just as much fun as I'm having when you open a chest and hear that absolute jam go off. The lower entry point makes the genre wildly accessible, which is one of the main reasons as to why more and more people are starting to see the light. However, there's something going on in the background as well. Vampire Survivors, a game that has over 2 million downloads, has a mobile port, and has won the award for Breakthrough Game of the Year in 2022, was made by one guy. The Binding of Isaac, one of the most historically important roguelikes ever, having over 5 million downloads, was created by two people. Enter the Gungeon, a hilarious and deeply challenging bullet hell where literally everything is a bullet, complete with an amazing soundtrack and fantastic DLC, was made by a team of six. Do you want to know how many people worked on that atrocious AAA title, Forspoken? So do I, but I'm not going to beat that to see the credits. It is a reoccurring theme that indie devs have to find creative ways to fight the uphill battle of competing against larger studios with more at their disposal. And though fantastic titles exist everywhere, the roguelike genre is dominated by them. The only AAA roguelike that I even know exists is Returnal. And to its credit, that game is a masterpiece, but that's not the point. The point is that this specific genre serves as a fantastic catalyst for smaller devs to make a massive name for themselves. Though Supergiant was doing decent creating great games like Bastion and Pyre, it was their roguelike Hades that won Action Game of the Year, alongside a bunch of other awards and we're getting a Hades sequel now. Let's go. So now we've covered how roguelikes are accessible, replayable, and come in every shape you could imagine. I think that's all we had to do. Multiplayer roguelikes are criminally underrated. I've not had more fun in my entire life than I have in roguelike titles specifically made to be played with friends. Because the second you get an ever-changing dungeon and allow not one, but four people to try out their luck, things go completely nuts. Everything from working together in order to defeat countless enemies, to standing around and trading items so that everyone can have a good build on their character, there's such a uniqueness to teaming up with a few friends and trying to clear a run. Out of every single roguelike I've played specifically designed for multiplayer, no game rises to the occasion better than Gunfire Reborn. Gunfire Reborn is my favorite roguelike, specifically because of how it was constructed for the multiplayer experience. As a single player title, this game is still incredibly fun and worth its weight in gold. But as a multiplayer 
multiplayer game, this game will change you. I'm going to try to explain this game's mechanics as quickly as I can so you can understand what I mean. For starters, there are currently eight different characters in the game. Some focus on melee, while others focus on long distance sniping. Some want single target damage, while others are trying to nuke the entire screen. Thus, everyone will be looking for weapons better for their specific character's abilities. Players find scrolls throughout their run that do everything from giving infinite ammo to reducing damage when enemies are close. Since scrolls aren't unique and also droppable, the game becomes a unique puzzle experience where players are forced to help each other out and make each other more powerful in order to win the run. If my sniper friend finds a scroll that makes my melee attacks deal more damage, he'll give it to me. If I find a scroll that increases damage the further an enemy is, I'll give it to the sniper player. And this unique experience of checking our inventory and finding out ways to make each other more powerful is something I've quite literally never seen done before. The possibilities are hilarious. Like one time we all just gave our scrolls to one guy and created an unkillable monster at the cost of our run. I always play the tank so my friends give me scrolls that make me unkillable and then just stand there in the background as I'm getting jumped. You can choose duplicates of the same character so everyone can be a sniper and then struggle due to a lack of a front line and wave clear. And it's just something that my words will never do justice. The weapons can be elemental, mixing elements make different things happen, there's boss fights, challenging modes that actually get insanely difficult. Hell, they just added an entire wave mode that has a unique boss and a brand new equipment system. And the list goes on and on and on. To take such a powerful and deeply entertaining genre and to expand upon it in a way that friends can meet online after a long day and challenge a new dungeon every night is just incredible. When I originally started playing this game, it was still gaining traction, but I'm so happy to see that it has over 70,000 very positive reviews on Steam. And hopefully, if you're someone who's looking to play a roguelike with friends, we can make that 70,001. I'm sure you can tell by now, but roguelikes are my favorite. And it's genuinely so cool seeing more and more people discover this genre and realize how fun it can be. If this video can just make one more person try out roguelikes and discover the madness, I would consider it a massive W. So whether you're looking for a quick way to burn 30 minutes or even 300 hours, if you're looking to experience something that changes and evolves while you evolve, or if you're just trying to goof off with friends and come up with some insane build, go download a roguelike because roguelikes are the genre that lasts forever. I think I'm gonna name the video that. I'm gonna go boot up Binding of Isaac now, so I hope you enjoyed whatever this was. It's still so crazy to me that the only AAA roguelike ever made is Returnal, and I really wonder if that's gonna change soon. But what's even crazier is how rare online multiplayer roguelikes are. Like, what are game devs even doing? I can't just keep playing Gunfire Reborn for another 200 hours. Oh wait, I can because it's a roguelike. I know this video is long, but since you made it to the end, I feel like I should reward you in the only way that roguelikes can, by giving you a random item. Oh, oh, it could be good. Oh, oh, no way, you got a subscribe button. You should totally press that and subscribe to the channel. That's a good one, that's legendary. That's very legendary, you should press it. You should sub to the channel and, uh, whoa, is that a bell too? You got a bell icon? You should press the bell icon so you don't miss videos. Wow, dude, you got such good luck. Those are sick. Those are awesome. Those are, those are good. Do it. All right, that's all I gotta say. I love you and I'll see you next week or tomorrow. I don't know. I made a second channel. Click on that. It's Scooch with three O's. We're gonna put a lot more filler content on there so we could focus on the main projects here. Okay, that's everything. Adios, bye. Ah, my legs, they fell asleep.